So good morning, everyone, and uh, <clears throat> looking forward to a great weekend, partly at home and partly spending with the AIOS. And we have uh, a, a very nice session now coming up, newer trends in cataract and refractive surgery. Uh, that is what we always look forward to at the annual conferences to see what new is coming and in which direction the ophthalmology is going to be. So let's start with the session today. And we have none other than Dr. Keiki Mehta today with us, uh, a great speaker and a, and a great surgeon with, with fantastic years of experience with him. And he'll be talking about astigmatism management. Over to you, Dr. Mehta, please. Thank you. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Oh. Yes. Cataract as a refractive surgery has changed radically. And be it LASIK or SMILE, it is now something which everyone wants and wants a perfect result at all times. The refractive sur surprises when they occur lead to an unhappy patient. It is extremely disappointing after a beautiful result to get a bad uh, result purely because we have missed out on astigmatism. Now, the big question is, how do we go about enhancing speed, augment accuracy, and at the same time, increase the results? There are various ways of doing that. We won't look into that in detail. But the most important thing is how to improve and enhance astigmatic measurements, which is what the talk of today's paper is. You utilize a little better equipment. We normally utilize the swept source IOL master. It has the advantage that it gives you a very accurate result. Big advantage also is that it gives you the ability to judge exactly the proper scan that it is working and gives you the ability to check that your fixation and your telemetry keratometry is working adequately. The other important role is the role of telemetry keratometry, which gives you the measure in different zones of the cornea and irrespective of how far the patient is from the Keratometer, it always maintains a constant spot size and therefore the astigmatic calculation remains stable. This is the one big, what we call as a motion independent keratometry, is the one big change which has occurred to enhance keratometry changes. The other thing is, of course, the most important thing is to look for other alternatives which are occur and to get a better accuracy in the measurements which have developed over a period of time. I'll go all these, miss out the few slides and go straight on to the meat of the matter. Now, the important thing is what has changed in the last year is posterior keratometry. The ability to add results to a corneal keratometry and gain a total keratometry, which is what has made the difference. It makes a difference in astigmatism because the present methods are not really satisfactory and the comprehensive scanners are not up to the mark. But posterior keratometry does cause a change. And this is something which you need to look into. Essentially, it's a combination of the cornea, the intracornea distance, it evaluates the posterior 3D points, calculates the torus fit, and then gives you the exact calculation as it runs. With this, with the machines which are now available, not only with the eyes but with the others also, we no longer need to use assumptions or nomograms and can calculate it accurately. Other important thing is to measure the angle alpha and kappa. As you are aware, alpha is the distant difference between the center of the limbus and the visual axis, while kappa is the difference between the center of the pupil and the visual axis. The previous one was the difference between the center of the limbus and the visual axis. Now, when we check these measures and we check out angle kappa, we need to apply it because the standard criteria which we utilize it if you want to get a really good result with any trifocal or an end of lenses, that your corneal aberration should be less than 0.4, the angle alpha should be less than 0.4, and you should have a normal macula with no other evidence and other pathologies. Once you can do that and you can pull the results out, you will get your data plotted in this manner, which gives you the exact astigmatic calculations, and that would enable you to choose an excellent possibility. 
choose a good trifocal. My personal choice, of course, is the size, which I'm very much attached to. The And the important next step is the accuracy of placement. Even if you can calculate an IOL with perfect accuracy, if you cannot place it perfectly, all your efforts are wasted. And the wow factor, which at the end of the second, the next day when the patient sits on your chair, is missing. So to do that, you need to use a markerless guided system, which I think anybody who handles premium IOLs should now go on to this system. I know it's a bit steep and a little costly, but in the long run, it makes a significant difference. You have the advantage that you have the biometer, which gives you the calculations. You have the computer-assisted surgery, what is known as a Callisto device. And you have the data which is pumped into the eyepieces of your Lumera microscope, which is basically a heads-up device. And these data can now be transferred down and give you a level of accuracy, as you see, the sort of a heads-up display, which shows you that it really should be working. The heads-up display is really which works great and makes a world of difference. I'll demonstrate it in a few moments. The system can almost literally in 100% of the cases assure you of a perfect toric fit. Another system which has come recently is the, is the data transfer system, which is known as Forum, where all the data is fed into it. You no longer have to do anything. And then you start in the morning, all your data is available to you immediately. So this computer-assisted surgery is what you really need to go in for. I'll show you a quick video exactly how this system works. There's my screen at the top. You can even notice that basically this is the uh, Calisto system, which is there. And you in inject your system. In, and you, as you can notice, in your eyepiece itself, the lines are shown. Now, the beauty about the system is whether the eye rotates or not, the axis which, it wrote, which is projected into your eyepiece will always remain at a precise position. So at every particular point, you can manage to get the precise access noting which you require. In other, other words, you can fit your astigmatism to a level of accuracy which we never originally had before. Let's look at it again for a few seconds. That gives you one more point. Another very important tip which I should give you and that is essentially, after you fit your axles into the precise position that you require, remove the liquid and push in air. Air makes your implant flush against the end, against the posterior capsule. And it, and it prevents the IOL from rotating subsequently. So that one little step will save you a lot of anguish later on when people turn on sick and the IOL rotated and it shifted out of place. Just push in air and then after that you can replace air once it is done. So the air removes the viscoelastic which is behind and gives you a proper addition. Demonstrating once again, you can just immediately <coughs> fit in the background and that works perfectly well. So you can utilize your, your, your viewpoints. The horizontal is your mind. The, the purple is the axis at which you should be working at. And the results of the data which you have had over the last few years, just a small representative data, shows the frequency of the cylinders and the IOL residual power, <coughs> the change in and the symptoms of the patient. It is there, a little night driving difficulties are there, but if you utilize lubricating drops at night, it decreases significantly. And if you have a happy patient, I just want to close with these few words. Everybody wants happiness, nobody wants pain, but you can't have a rainbow without a little rain. You will have a few glare and flare symptoms, but you in return for which you get 24 hours of happiness. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Keki, for elaborating in detail um, about controlling the astigmatism and the significance of it. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think this is a very, very important step in giving satisfaction and as Dr. Mehta said, to the, the wow factor on day one, uh, which is what gets you more patients and which is what gives you a lot of satisfaction. And for that, the patient should be having crisp vision. And for that, as Dr. Mehta showed that a higher percentage, close to 30, have a preoperative astigmatism. And unless we address it with, with whatever means are available with us, 
uh, <clears throat> it is, we are not going to get the good results. I have a question, Dr. Keki Mehta. Uh, what will be your suggestions to those ophthalmologists who don't have access to all the space age technologies? Because I find that a lot of people have a mental block and barrier towards to using Toric uh, because they have an impression that if you don't have all the space age technology, you can't do the Torics. What will be your, your uh, message for them? That's not true because before we had the space age technology, as you put it, we were still getting a reasonably good result. The important thing is you mark it on the slip lamp with the patient sitting. The mistake we, people tend to make is they mark, tend to mark it when the patient is lying down. And that causes the rotation factor which is there in the eye which is there. In some cases, the eye rotates almost about 7 to 10 degrees off. So you have to mark it on the slit lamp. And once that is marked, then you have the patient lying down. There really should not be a difficulty. Mark it properly and make sure that the mark does not eradicate, erase. There is a little tip which we had in the later days started. Uh, we had a small little cautery which had a flat tip. We used to apply that at the edges of the cornea. The big advantage is what that never got erased off. And you could put a drop of fluorescein and it would show perfectly where the where you had marked it. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Keki. I think uh, the two points that you have highlighted, which are very, very important for the younger ophthalmologists who don't have access to this, is it is not a barrier. They should not be hesitant in doing the toric. And second is that the marking should be done when the patient is sitting. I think these two are very, very important uh, pearls uh, that you have given. Uh, any any other question for anyone who would like to ask? Any other question? Shashi, uh, you you muted, Shashi. Sorry, Dr. Keki and Dr. Grewal. Thank you, Kudlu. Uh, Dr. Keki and Dr. Grewal both. Uh, if you're putting a multifocal where it's important to control the cylinder, so would you put a multifocal toric at 0 0.75, 0 0.5, what uh, one, what would be your uh, thing? 0.7.5 minutes. I didn't figure out. Say it again. No, the minimum cylinder which you would, since a multifocal toric is correction is very important, astigmatism. Yes. So no, 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 the the amount of amount of cylinder. Oh. Now, when, when your cylindrical power crosses 0 0.75, you have to consider a toric lens. Yes. Uh, Dr. Grewal? Yeah, Shashi, my take on this, or not my take, what I do is that up to 0 0.75 cylinder, I'll be doing the LRI because I do the flax in all the trifocals and 0.75 or above, 100% it has to be toric. There's no second question about it. Even and I do the same, sir. 0.75 above torics. Yeah, it, it's important. Sashi, your question was very good and it's very important uh, not to leave the trifocals with a residual cylinder. A monofocal lens, 0.75 cylinder patient will not even notice what is it. They will not even come to know the difference in vision. Uh, but in trifocal, the, the tolerance of trifocal uh, for non-ametropia or ametropia in the post-op is very low. So these cases, uh, you have to, if, if you feel in the pre-op period that you will not be able to achieve ametropia for some reason due to the factors in the eye, better to do a monofocal and not to do the trifocal. Thank you. Absolutely agree. So we can now move on to the next talk. Uh, is Dr. Deepak Magur there? Can somebody help me in seeing if he's logged in? Just one, one minute, sir. I'm also looking. Uh, not yet, sir. Yet to. He's not been locked in. So then, uh, instead of waiting, uh, uh, if there are any questions about Dr. Kekis, we can take. Otherwise, we move on to Dr. Krishna Prashad Kudlu, and uh, he's going to share his experience about a very important topic that is combining bifocals and EDOP. Uh, it's very interesting talk. I will be looking forward to your experience, Dr. Kudlu. Please over to Dr. Kudlu. Thank you so much, Grewal, sir. It's my pleasure to be part of this wonderful symposium talking with along with you and uh, KK, sir. So I'll be talking about uh, the combining bifocals and EDOF with my short experience. Even I need some of the guidance from you once the talk is over. This is my financial disclosure. I'm a consultant to Carl Zeiss India. 
so as we all know that natural crystalline lens has got good accommodation clear vision at all distance which is glass free even clear vision in all lighting condition with a good contrast sensitivity with minimal abrasion my question to myself can an intraocular lens do the same job as the natural lens so let me talk about the multifocal intraocular lens it have got a gradual diffractive strip on the iol implant that create a smooth transition between the focal points so here it bends incoming light to the multiple focal point thus increase in vision in various lighting condition especially whoever we implanted normally patient will have a very good near visual acuity and moderately good contrast sensitivity at all distance so now consideration for bifocal so the patient should have a strong desire to be a spectacle independent and i my practice always it would be always do the patient within the age of 35 to 75 which is not exactly a rule but it's very important to know their functional and occupational requirement so we have to take a detailed history very important like hobbies like whether doing whether they are doing painting playing piano playing cards or a, they are just a unusual avid reader so the early multifocals were basically bifocal providing a distance and a near vision like it is it is a fantastic lens especially for housewife till today I, even my first choice is at least 09 but now lifestyle changes of the digital work environment brought in the focus of intermediate vision so the active lifestyle requirement also necessitated the need for all range of vision in all light condition because of this purpose i think most of the companies nowadays they introduce with the trifocal intraocular lens and later with the id of iols let me come to the point of active night driving for all these patient even a short term glare and halo effect will be intolerable so we have to counsel them properly about all these glare and halos sometime i feel that monofocal may be the best option but the they have difficulty in viewing the panel screen on the meters so coming to the multifocals or bifocal patient who besides having the cataract removed want to become the spectacle independent or the candidates for refractive iol so you have got three lenses with us one is bifocals id of lenses and trifocals This are uh, this is eighty is a eight zero nine and the uh, ed of eight two nine and the uh, trifocals are eight three nine model. So coming to all these uh, lenses, basically pupil size independent lenses, especially both eighty Lisa and eighty Lara, the design in such a way that which is pupil independence, containing of a diffractive rings until the IL periphery. So. coming to the atl is a multifocal i have already spoken about few about about this basically it's a distant dominant diffractive multifocal intraocular lens it's a independent of pupil size smooth steps in the refractive diffractive structure but asymmetrical light distribution that means 65% for the distance and 35% for the near and pseudo accommodated range is almost up to four diopter so due to this uh, oh, asymmetrical light distribution this at lisa intraocular lens have achieve a high yield uh, property the optical performance under the mesopic condition differs only slightly from the photopic condition the contrast sensitivity is improved to a level which is within the normal range of for healthy fakic patients this is my very much old uh, video even i think almost uh, around oh, i started this lenses when they introduce even patient with a one cylinder i used to put a toric multifocal the model number is called 909 now zeiss has withdrawn this model but it was a fantastic lens but to, always we used to tell the patient especially there like only about the intermediate vision they need to adjust their lifestyle so this is about the contrast sensitivity as i was telling before for photopic and the mesopic condition so these are the advantage with these lenses uh, light is distributed asymmetrically as i said that 65% for the distance and the 35% for near independent of pupil size 
the main thing about all these three lenses they do it something called smp technology and with the abrasion correcting optimized aspheric optic let me come to the edof lens so extended depth of focus lens is a excellent compromise of benefits of both monofocal and the multifocal lens more spectacular independence compared to monofocal intraocular with a few visual side effect compared to the multifocal lens especially attract to the patient to have an active lifestyle and what to be largely spectacular independent but they may be sensitive to visual side effect except to wear the glasses for the fine print so this edof lens is a perfectly balanced between the increased spectacular independence and the less visual side effect of course i don't want to tell about this smooth microface technology that is smp technology so the compared to the bifocal they are little bit smooth on so that it'll have a less glare and halos this is what i have picked one study from the outside telling that the patients who have been implanted this edof lenses 71% of the patients still need not have to like 29% of the patient need not have to wear the glasses 75% of the patient require a glass for very fine print but the these lenses are very good with the you know, neutral aspheric optics these are the benefit compared to the 809 especially less sensitive for a decentration and tilt because of the pattern of the rings widens the focus range of three focus plane thus supports a continuous focus extension when you are seeing for far when you are seeing for intermediate and near of course uh, neutral aspherosity design does not interfere with the mainly with the corneal higher order abrasion better suited even you can implant in the post lasik patient so these are the advantage all these lenses are hydrophilic with a hydrophobic surface something called a hybrid lenses it's a Four point haptic design with MICS, which can even go through one point eight. But normally we do two point two incision. The one more advantage, what I felt, the chances of PCO is very less because of the anti PCO coating on the posterior surface of the intraocular lens. That is what I was telling. These are the benefits with these lenses. So this is just. Uh, Doctor Kudlu, you you can continue and complete your talk. Don't worry about the time, sir. Okay, sir. So my video is not playing. Hopefully, it should play after. So this is a uh, about the AT Lara. As I already said, that excellent compromise of benefits of both monofocal and multifocal intraocular lens. More spectacle independent compared to the monofocal IELs with a fewer visual side effect compared with the multifocal IELs. Even patient they are okay with the wearing a fine print. So. of course i need to talk about the neural ab adaptation which is a process that takes place as the brain adapts to change in the visual information being supplied to the eye optical system so visual complaints are not related to the abrasions they are related to the neural adaptation and the success of a patient outcome continues to improve because they have to adapt to the abrasion so this is a now combining with edof so with the multifocal so this is what we started doing because of this is our experience of 30 patients what i did here for dominant eye i have implanted a edof and the non dominant eye i have put a multifocal so this is my inference 90% of the patient had a very more than 90% of the patient had a very good distance vision intermediate and far intermediate this is what i wanted to say intermediate and far intermediate vision and non dominant i had a very good near vision effect and the glare and halos if you compare suppose if you want to put a trifocal in both the eyes definitely there is a some patients complain of glare and halos but in my these 30 patients glare and halos are only one patient actually complained but within a week he was all right the glare and halos are much much lesser he was very much comfortable for night driving extremely happy patient but i personally feel that i have to do more patients more longer follow up required for a accurate results so in conclusion more than 90% of the patient are satisfied for a distance as a because of the extended depth of focus lenses gives a excellent distance and intermediate vision and also for intermediate vision 
adding multifocal to the non dominant eye helps in a very fine near vision more than 80 to 90% of the patient are spectacle independent hardly any complaint of glare shadowing or halos are seen as the design quality of both eyes makes it comfortable for the patient long term follow up must be seen as the results are quite promising thank you one and all thank you thank you so much uh, dr kurlu for a detailed uh, presentation i like the way you went into detail to describe the the needs and the experiences of the patient as far as vision is concerned and i like that you spent a lot of time on that because that is the most important thing in trifocal to understand what the patients are expectations and are the patients expectations meeting what your product can deliver Uh, and thank you so much for highlighting that i have one question that would you bit if you have a choice between 80 lara both highs and 80 lisa both highs what will you choose uh once again depending upon the patient occupation sir if they are like uh, they want to drive like some patient ask that uh, i got a hobby of driving 400 kilometers weekly twice thrice even though he is 60 plus still i would go ahead with the 80 lara if the patient if they say that i have got a driver oh, i don't have any um, uh, much work with the driving problem or active night life then i go with the multifocal but now my first preference will be trifocal sir for such patients first preference will be trifocal the normally 809 bifocal lens of course it's a tremendous very good lenses from zeiss but i prefer i love to put for housewife sir housewife sir the people actually they'll be very happy with this bifocal lenses none of including my mother only one eye i implanted bifocal other eye i operated long back around 15 20 years before but she is very happy one eye multifocal 809 other eye is monofocal she is very happy so what i wanted to say is only housewives and those who are in the house i love to put multifocal otherwise my next choice will be trifocal so these are the patient actually compromise in between trifocals and the monofocal monofocal and eye doff because they want every they don't want to wear the glass and lesser side effect we tried with the most of the patients like the dominant eye putting eye doff and non dominant eye with the 809 model but it works out really well sir it works even better than trifocals uh thank you so much uh, my if i share my experience my experience uh, i have used the 80 lara um, eat off lenses for quite some time uh, the patients were not very happy with their near vision so they had to use especially if the light is not ideal they need to have reading glasses uh, now i have shifted 100% to trifocal lenses and wherever the cases are i may exclude them for selection criteria but if i'm using uh, a correction for if i'm using a press biopia correcting lens then i'm using a trifocal in all the cases either trifocal cases or trifocal uh, toric cases now the question of night vision and night driving now i i feel that a lot depends upon how the patients are counseled uh the best thing which i would like to hear in the post op period is that if i ask the patient did you experience some halos around light and if the patient says yes yes you had told us so that's fine we are fine with that now that is that situation tells how important is the pre operative counseling and one way of looking at these halos is that most of the people except the situation that you mentioned that somebody is a professional driver and has to drive 3 400 kilometers at night uh if they have a patience of 6 months they will be fine after 6 months due to the neuro adaptation otherwise night driving in out of 24 hours in a day or or 24 by 7 into a week someone will be doing night driving for half an hour one hour or one and a half hours now if you have to weigh the inconvenience of using reading glasses versus inconvenience of driving a little slowly at night for those one to two hours in a week i personally would definitely go in for a trifocal and drive a little slowly at night because i know that after those all those who had problems with halos when they come back after one year they and i ask them that how are you doing how is your problem with the halos the the standard answer comes i do see them but now i'm fine with it they don't bother me 
Now that is very important, and and that is where besides your surgical skills, besides besides giving patients zero zero, the preoperative counseling in these cases is very very important. Um, I would also like to have opinion. Uh, Dr. Keki has, Dr. Shashi has experience of these lenses, and Dr. Keki also, if he's here, no, he's not here. No, so, actually, I just wanted to oh, add yeah. one point, sir. Why I did the, tried this? The advantage of one more advantage with the EDOF lens is a far intermediate vision, sir. Like trifocal intermediate is very good, but uh, in yes, EDOF, sir. far intermediate is also very good, sir. So if you combining, okay, far intermediate, intermediate, and near, I think this combination I thought will be much better with a lesser complaint. And even if you think about the price factor also. Lens, even our cost price factor, we can give the best out to the patient. That is what I I just did in 30 patients, but all those patients are very happy, sir. No, I, I fully uh -huh. agree with you. And, and the logic that you are saying is absolutely fine. It, it's, it's a very good logic. And, and the, this mix and match has been around for a long time. And I fully agree with you what you are saying. Uh, Greval, sir, and Kudlu, could you all both uh, give individual opinion on why the EDOF lenses? don't have a repeatably predictive value in all the patients. They don't behave the same way in 10 patients as you would put a multifocal or a trifocal. Kudlu, would you like to answer? Uh, predictability, what I feel, see, even I used initially a lot of uh, EDOF lenses. Uh, if you think about around 70% of the patient, even they don't require for a very fine print. But in that patient, I really observed about their pupil condition. They had a very small pupil and uh, because of their pupil condition, probably that might be the reason they don't require even glass for a very fine print. But some patients with a slightly larger uh, pupil in some uh, mesopic condition, this EDOF lenses behavior is not that good in, when you compare with the trifocal lens. That is what I felt. Of course, in EDOF lens, uh, the overall, the uh, the lens is mainly for the uh, intermediate and the far intermediate, two focal points, not exactly for the near. The, correct, no? I think I, uh, whatever I am telling, uh, correct, no, Gravel, sir? No, the, what you are saying is, yeah, what you are saying is absolutely right. I would like to put it in a little different way. Yes, sir. Since the range of vision with EDOF is less than what it is with trifocal, the satisfaction level of those patients will not be as good as it is with trifocal. Shashi, does that? No, your no, no. That what I'm trying to say is, you are talking what about, I'm saying you, is that you cannot predict the, as you can predict that the patient will be less happy for near fine, but in a trifocal, he'll be more for intermediate fine, but you can predict it in five patients, that will be the result. You cannot with same certainty say with the next five EDOFs or at any more. Why? I, I, I agree with you. That is why I have shifted 100% to trifocals. Okay, thanks. I agree with you. <laughs> Deepak Megur is already logged in, sir. I think he can go ahead with yeah. this. So we can move on. So we move on to uh, Dr. Deepak Megur. Uh, welcome, Dr. Deepak, to this session. Thank and you, sir. You are talking on a subject is, which is very dear to my heart. And uh, in fact, uh, I won the Colonel Rangachari way back in 95, and it was related to photography and ophthalmology only. So I'm very keenly looking forward to your talk on microscope and video recording solutions for new practices. Welcome to the session. Uh, am I audible and uh, my screen visible, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, I think suddenly we're shifting from a totally different Hi, topic. Hi, dear friends. Now. This is and uh, uh, thank you, organizers, for giving me the opportunity. I think the aim of the presentation is to share a few practical tips and tricks which would enhance uh, surgical video recording. And uh, well, this has been a topic which is very close to my heart for uh, many years now. And I've been struggling to find the best way possible. And most often question which is asked to me has always been that, which camera do I use? So I uh, just want to reiterate that, you know, uh, there are multiple things which make into uh, a great image. It is not just the uh, camera. So why do we require surgical recording? First, let's analyze that, you know, apart from all the various reasons you want to document for medical legal uh, issues uh, to teach. But the biggest uh, reason why one should have a recording system is 
I think, to learn. It, there's no doubt in my mind that we become a better surgeon by just analyzing our own videos and the techniques can be much more refined. So seeing our own recordings is the best teacher we can have. So my tip would be to invest in a recording system from day one of your practice. I think that should be my tip to all the beginners who would want to start off. What makes a good video? You know, it has to be clear and it has to be sharp and the composition has to be very good. It has to be very well centered. So it catches the attention of the viewer. Two ingredients are required for a great video, the right technique and the right equipment or the gear. So I'll be discussing both of them uh, in uh, brief. So we need to have a very good centration and focus and composition. You have got the same equipment, same microscope, same camera, but the focus is out. The centration is not good enough. And definitely uh, the equipment hardly has a role to play in such a situation. If you are not sure, like, you know, you're not uh, conscious that your uh, centration focus are right. Is not going to help you much. So this is one of the most common reasons, you know, that the camera alone is not going to give the trick or the microscope alone is not going to help you out. So we need to be conscious about these aspects before discussing. So one simple trick which I would always want to uh, suggest is have a big monitor at the foot end of your table so that the assistant is always seeing and guiding me that, you know, uh, that uh, the it is well-centered and focused. This feedback I have to have always. So it's always uh, placed directly opposite to my assistant so that he can always guide me that you know whether it's centered well or not. Well, another trademark or hallmark of every good surgeon is then he always asks the question, am I seeing well enough? Okay, a pulling of fluid or decentration is just not good enough. Just retake of everything and you'll be fine. Now, uh, composition is extremely important. It, you, every part, the part which you want to focus and highlight has to be uh, centered and it has to grab the attention of the viewer. So that is how we want to, you know, do it. Now here the field is extremely wide, wide. So the action is not being so much well appreciated. Look at this. We have drape is visible here. Speculum is visible here. Drexis is being done, but you know, it is not so much creating an impact. Contrary to this, look at this image now, wherein you're absolutely focused and you really, the, it grabs the attention of the viewer. You know, what is the, uh, what the surgeon wants to show. So if we have can understand these basic principles, like, you know, how we can enhance the image quality by following a few of these important uh, you know, uh, nuances, I should say. So good centration and uh, trying to, you know, uh, center it well so that an appropriate magnification, you know, I would like to uh, just add that, you know, you want to highlight the area of interest. Now here, it looks like, you know, it's the action is having too far away. It's the same, you know, nucleus fragmentation is being done, but it's too far away. Can't be uh, impressed by that. Now you want to, it can also be done in post. So like, you know, you want to crop in while you're editing. You can do that. But the problem is, you know, you lose image quality there. And another drawback, if you're, if you're zoomed in too much, like, you know, if you're zoomed in too much like this here, the chances of you getting out of field is very high. So you need to strike the right balance between the zooming and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the centration. The second most important trip is always keep the camera rolling. You cannot start the camera once event has happened because they don't tell, the complications don't tell and then happen because you want to catch that moment. And that's the reason why the camera has to be on from the drape, which is putting on to the speculum, which comes out here. So uh, drape on to drape of the reel has to be on. So moving on to the equipment, the stuff we require, of course, a good operating microscope, a beam splitter and a C mount. And here I would like to just stress here uh, that I would insist that the beam splitter and the C mount, they it's better if we buy the original ones, that is from the manufacturers themselves. Like if you're wearing a Zeiss microscope, it always makes sense to buy the original ones here because the quality of the optics does make a significant difference in the amount of uh, the clarity of uh, the images which we get here. And uh, there are different uh, um, uh, adapters available. And I would always recommend to go ahead and uh, use the uh, original ones. Now, moving on quickly to the, uh, the camera, you know, uh, traditionally the camera which we are using has been the uh, CCD cameras. And uh, we use a small C-mount adapter with a lens so that we can focus the image. And the sensor sizes are typically very small in these CCD camera. Uh, we had a single chip three, uh, and then the three chip camera, which we had used for long. And nowadays we are getting in 4K as well, the small CCD cameras. And uh, this is a, uh, uh, this cost is slightly older one, maybe a few years back, it was costing around 
20,000 US dollars for a full HD three chip camera uh, by Ikegami and similarly by Sony. Now we have got uh, the 4K uh, versions as well. Uh, but I found that, you know, uh, compared to these, we can have a better recording system uh, than what uh, these expensive uh, options available. So I started using a DSLR like thing way back in 2014. And we adapted to our Zeiss uh, slit uh, microscope. Uh, initially, I there was not availability of uh, this adapter, which attaches this uh, uh, camera, DSLR camera to the beam splitter. And uh, Zeiss had one, but they did not, they were not uh, aware of one. But eventually uh, I could, uh, when I migrate to a full frame camera, I found out that Zeiss had a, a DSLR adapter in their own portfolio. And we were, they were not aware of it at all. They call it as a, um, a still camera adapter. But I found that this adapter, it is called as a T2, uh, this is a DSLR adapter made by Zeiss. And this uh, is good enough for a full frame DSLR mirror-like camera. So we have to have a small attachment called a T2 adapter for the Sony uh, camera, and then you're good to go. Well, the advantage with this has been that, you know, uh, these cameras are less expensive, 3000 US dollars or less than that now, which is almost 13% of the cost of this marriage. And the image quality, which we get is uh, phenomenally good. Uh, there's no doubt about this. The only thing which was lacking was we didn't have a good adapter for that. And that's the reason where, you know, the Zeiss uh, DSLR adapter was there in their portfolio. And now we can use them and have an excellent uh, uh, image quality. So the camera is not expensive and the adapter also is uh, very much affordable. So with that, you know, the combination itself will cost not more than around 4,000 US dollars now, the best of the cameras and the best adapters. And you have a decent option. The, the good thing is nowadays, the cost of the cameras is continuously going down because of the innovations which are happening in the electronic industry. And let me just pause here for a moment and let us show that, you know, we were using a camera size of, uh, sensor size of this initially in our smaller CCD cameras, which are similar to what we have in our phones. These are the ones which we have in the phone. But the method which I am using is something like this. It's a large frame sensor. The advantage is it captures more light here. And uh, that's the reason why we have better image quality, especially when the light is low. So this is a traditional uh, sensor camera in our microscope camera, which we're using. And this is similar to what we have in our phone. Uh, it's good enough. Uh, to interrupt, the... sir, but uh, we're running short of time. If you could sum it up, uh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So I think... Uh... No, you can. I think the session is up to 11.20 and this the time at the moment is 10.45. Am I right in that? Can you correct me if I'm wrong? And we have just one speaker more, Dr. Mahipal. So I think it's an interesting, very relevant topic. You can, you, you can continue, Deepak, please. All please. right, sir. You can All continue right. and take your time, please. No problem. Sir. All right. No, I, I'm, uh, my speak is going to be only on, uh, say, you know, 20 minutes, uh, 15 minutes itself. So... So, okay, uh, uh, having spoken about the cameras, we have got multiple options available here and we can also go for uh, the advantage of going for a, um, a consumer grade DSLR camera is it is uh, less expensive and the quality is uh, almost better than most of the, uh, the, uh, the small chip 3CCD cameras available. Uh, having said that, uh, what the most important aspect of the image quality, you know, you always talk of camera, but I'd like to stress here that, you know, cameras are becoming inexpensive by the day, but what is more important? Most often we get a complaint that, you know, uh, this, so what are the ingredients? Let me just stop here. This is a Lumera eye microscope, which I'm using. This is a beam splitter and you have this DSLR adapter and you have the camera here. So this DSLR adapter is made for that particular camera. The most common, you know, complaint which I always get is the images which we get is foggy. They say in spite of using the same camera which I am using, they say the images are foggy. They are not as sharp as what I get. So there are multiple reasons for it. The most important thing would be the optical quality of the glass. So this is what I want to just stress here, because in spite of having the best camera, because the image has to uh, has to transfer through all these glass elements here. All these have glass elements. So ultimately. The glass, unfortunately, continues to be more expensive uh, compared to the electronic items which we have. 
So you don't have uh, the microscopes are not getting uh, cheaper by the day, nor the uh, the adapters and all those things. So the glass is what I want to end, uh, no, and uh, just want to reiterate here. The camera is really being inexpensive, but the glass elements, which probably are more important than the camera, they continue to be uh, expensive. But mind you, they are worthwhile spending on them. Okay, you can compromise on the camera if you're really struggling, but I would recommend always to go ahead and buy the uh, the optical elements that has to be the best. So the camera are really inexpensive. So just let me share with you what are the difference with having a, 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 an optic which is of a lesser grade. Here I'm using a same camera uh, in two different, same microscope, but the adapters are different here. Uh, the only the adapter which, uh, which, contain, which uh, connects the camera. Now this is a locally made adapter here and we can see that uh, in, it looks all right when you just have a first look. And then again, I'd like, just like to compare it with the original Zeiss adapter, which we have here. And again, when you see on individually, the difference might not be very much dramatic for you to appreciate. But when you see them together, uh, look at the, the aberration which we have here. This is a chromatic aberration. If I can zoom in here now and show you that the uh, the... So you can see these halos around the, uh, the light which you see, and there's a lot of noise when we see around here. So just when you, a casual observer can match it, but you know, for you know, you uh, want to really have a good quality image, the glass does makes a significant difference. I think we need to understand the basics of photography uh, for, because uh, the surgeon has to be aware of these things because giving the best equipment as well is not going to do the job. Now, what is wrong with this equipment? The field is too wide, you know, it's not, does not grab the interest, it is less immersive and it has a washed off appearance because there's very less contrast and very less saturation. And uh, we can fix it to a certain extent I editing. Now, at the same step now, this is the same step which is being shown, this rexis is being done. And what I'm done is I'm just zoomed in a little bit more. Of course, there is a lot of clarity and contrast is there because the composition is very good. It's a grabs the you know attention of the thing we can make this uh, image slightly better by in the editing table so what i do is i just crop it a little bit and then try to enhance contrast and saturation we can do it but the point is you know uh, the second instrument you have a poorer uh, equipment some areas are very overexposed some of uh, them but we ideal image that you know, every part of the image has to be equally well exposed so exposure uh, contrast and saturation is something which we want to have so just like to summarize now, because um, we are running out of shot, I uh, guess, because. To summarize now, okay. So uh, what are the ingredients? What ingredients make for a great image? I think the first would always be knowledge, then the hardware, then how you capture it. And then last but not the least, editing. All these are important components which make for a great image. So, you know, you need to be uh, knowledgeable. Uh, if you're not, you just read up and see and understand photography basics. There's no excuse for that. Training your eye to read an image. What's a good image and how do you know it? Right? Then obviously the most important is the hardware part of it. You have to uh, invest in the optical elements because the microscope, beam splitter and adam ad uh, adapter the glass is probably the most critical aspect of all this. And ob obviously choose the camera based on your optical elements and also your budget. And lastly, when you're capturing, try to ensure that you capture in the highest possible resolution and quality which you can afford. Because the higher resolution you have and higher bitrate you capture, you're always going to have uh, end up having consuming more amount of hard disk. But you know, if it is really passionate, it's worthwhile investing in it. Uh -huh. Always keep a master copy because when you keep on editing, you lose the clarity over a period of time. And you can always output uh -huh. and store in HD. Uh -huh. no, uh, editing no like always enhance the image yeah, quality. Clear uh, uh, invest in the good computer. Necessary skills are important to how to learn. I think with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Deepak, for uh, fantastic.
fantastic talk i think uh, this has to be i think dr maipal sir is also uh, just listening to your talk i think uh, it was eye opener as far as uh, you are the king in um, video recording in uh, indian ophthalmology we are uh, i'm very happy that you are part of uh, even our karnataka ophthalmic society and we do have got a uh, award in your daddy's name i think that's what i was remembering so maipal sir any comments on this particular talk no i think it's uh, really fantastic uh, deepak uh, he's i've always been fascinated by his uh, videos and he always gets the awards and i think uh, uh, this is the first time i have uh, listened to what all he uses uh, uh, and how he has progressed to get these uh, great uh, videos and uh, i think all of us should uh, learn uh, from the fact what he emphasizes that the best teacher is to see your own videos and to kind of uh, critically analyze as to what went wrong where and how you need to improve so videography should be an essential part of the cameras uh, of the microscopes it's only the cost which makes it uh, prohibitive but i think deepak has given great tips to reduce the cost and deepak i'll get in touch with you to uh, buy those cameras and those uh, get those adapters because uh, just now i bought a ikegami thing which cost me a bomb 12 14 lakhs i i, I think for hyderabad and i bought three of them so i should have listened to your lecture earlier I imagine sir you are calculating that time, which is the best for <laughs> because when you are running so many center definitely you should be thinking like that i was thinking about that only sir yeah thank thank you so much uh, deepak that was a great talk and at the what you mentioned initially about the composition which is very very important most of the times you see people presenting videos and the composition is not good so that was a very very important point maintain the composition and for that field of surgery that you do not realize that the cornea is getting decentered so i instruct my assistant to monitor on the screen that if at any stage the decentration is going out they will they will prompt me to recenter the microscope and that helps a lot to have good videos your talk was excellent as as dr maipal has said i is going to benefit a lot of people thank you so much with this we move on to the next talk uh, the future of cataract refractive surgeries and my experience with premium iwls and we have none other than dr mahipal sajdev uh, we have been seeing him every evening over the past one and a year so it doesn't need any introduction over to you dr mahipal for your presentation thank you very much dr garewal i'll be talking about uh, my experience with premium iwls and my talk is primarily bases the a uh, need for uh, the near vision and the intermediate vision that is there now uh, when you are looking at uh, the lifestyle that is there today as uh, even uh, we are just now making our presentations we are using the uh, computers the laptops uh, everyone is using the uh, the ipads you are using the smartphones so these are just certain numbers that even among seniors who are the patients who undergo cataract surgery roughly a third own tablets and a fifth uh, own e readers so nowadays there nobody reads books these are the kindle and all that uh, you have and roughly 4 in 10 seniors are also smartphone users and this penetration is going to go uh, with the announcement of the new smartphone by mukesh ambani in india starting 10th of september at very low cost along with google i think smartphones are going to be the uh, the uh, ultimate uh, device that all of us are going to own now what is the problem with the cataract surgery that we do that we still didn't have intraocular lenses that could take care of this intermediate vision uh bifocals had come in uh, obviously with the, also their sets of problems uh, dysphotopsia being one of them but the major problem was that the intermediate vision uh, was not there and therefore if you want precise vision uh, premium iols uh, uh, are uh, something that you need a continuous range of vision uh, with the least disruption which is this which is there so premium iols are becoming more and more popular and today cataract surgery i would say is turning or cataract surgery is today equal to refractive surgery where once you are doing a cataract surgery you are getting the option to correct the underlying refractive error of that individual the patient's expectation on perfect post operative refractive outcomes have increased and this induces a high demand on precise outcomes which include precise biometry which has been talked about and high performance iol power calculations every other day we have some or the other good uh, formula but uh, we have uh, the gold standards like the barrett etc which are available 
and you need to have good outcome then the femto laser is added to the precision that is there counseling also is something which is very very important so just to sum up what i have said so far biometry uh, the iol master 700 uh, 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 even though i am speaking in a zeiss session but i think that is the best biometer that is available because it's a swept source and measures the posterior corneal measurements gives you higher data point acquisition and the ray tracing uh, uh, formulas are there and artificial uh, intelligence driven formulas are there now let us come to the surgery which i will not be talking in detail but the surgery uh, you have the femto laser the markerless uh, toric Uh, the surgical planning tools intraoperative imaging tools and astigmatism so all these are great tools that we are having and in between comes this particular thing which is the intraocular lenses and today you have a range of intraocular lenses the amount of money that is being invested in r&d by all the companies is phenomenal and therefore you have various ways at which you are trying to get uh, the perfect range of vision which is there now i have been using uh, i have possibly used uh, uh, close to maybe 1000 of these uh, tri uh, 80 lisa tri lenses and the lisa word comes from l which is light intensity being distributed asymmetrically between distance intermediate and near uh, depending uh, that the, this is the ideal requirement that should be there uh lisa perf high performance optics is independent so the eye comes for independent of the pupil size that is there and then they have the technology which is called as the smp technology so s comes from there the technology for the lens service which is providing maximal optical quality that is something i'll be talking about in a little more detail and then you have an abrasion correcting optics which is there Uh, which corrects the positive spherical abrasion of the human cornea so lisa therefore comes from uh, the distribution of the light uh, independence from pupil size uh, smp technology and the abrasion correcting iol that is there now when you are looking at the tri family the uh, at lisa tri family that means the tri obviously means it's a tri focal lens so there is obviously the far distance that you have and then there is an intermediate distance which is at 80 cm which is 1.66 diopter is the addition and then plus 3.33 which is at 40 cm so it is not at 60 cm but it is at 40 cm which is the uh, good reading uh, thing uh, distance which is there so these are the uh, these are the additions that is there now if you look at a bifocal lens which was here so you can see there is a big bk which comes in this particular area but if you have the tri the intermediate loss of vision which was there gets blunted so this loss is not there so there is a smooth defocus curve for spectacle uh, independence at all distances that is for distance intermediate and near and if you look at also the light distribution as compared to the enlightened technology or the convolution technology you can see that 50% of the light in this particular case is used for distance 20% is used for intermediate and 30% is used for the near foci so near gets 30% and overall it is about 85.7% of the light that is transmitted so this is uh, a very good technology as one can see as regards the light distribution now the second point that was talked about was the pupil independence so if you see that the lens the optic of the lens is divided into two zones the inner where the black ring is there and the outer So the trifocal zone is only on the optical diameter of 4.34 millimeters, and outside of it is the bifocal zone. So this is where it is, and irrespective of the pupil size, you can see that the person has good trifocal, uh, good trifocality that is there. Now let us come to the third point, and the third point is the estimate. Can, can somebody mute uh, Dr. Raja Lakshmi? Raja Lakshmi, can you mute yourself? yeah thank you so the third is the smp technology which is the smooth micro pulse uh, microphase technology where you can see that when you had the conventional diffractive lenses there was these steps that were there and these steps in between the zones were responsible for ca causing the a uh, dysphotopic phenomena etc but what has been done in the at lisa is that the front profile of these lies lenses 
they have smoothened these steps. So whenever there is a step which is very significant, the light would get distorted at that particular point and the phase zones between the principal zones get smoothened out. So this is something very, very important which has reduced the complaints of the patient to a significant amount. The, third, the last thing is the abrasion correcting option. <laughs> Uh, which is in the AT trilisa. So you can see that this gives you best contrast uh, sensitivity and sharper vision where the correction that you have for the positive uh, spherical abrasion of the cornea is 0 0.18, which according to Zeiss is the best of an average uh, uh, cornea. And what they are saying is that if you have a higher amount of abrasion correcting, and if there is some decentration, because this is minus minus spherical abrasion, if you have a higher correcting spherical abrasion and it gets decentered, then the degradation in the quality of the vision is very significant. Now, the other thing that they have done is for PCO, uh, this thing because uh, protection, because this is a hydrophilic with a hydrophobic surface and there were uh, some complaints in the earlier version of having PCO. So what they have is a square edge and the the in addition to the square edge, these, there is an anti-PCO posterior profile. So you can see apart from the square edge, this is the profile that you have for NTPCO and this reinforces the square edge giving you uh, the outcome. So this is just to show you the loading. This is the plate lens. You can see this is a plate lens. Uh, you're putting it in the, the injector system and it goes very well, very well into the, uh, into the okay. So this is the lens and then you can see the rings which are there. So our results, uh, uh, this is of about 500 of our eyes, which is monoocularly 85.4% achieved 66 and N6 uncorrectly, uncorrected binocularly, uh, uncorrected 66 and N6 was achieved in 95%. 98% of the patients reported uh, complete independence from glasses for near, intermediate and distance. And also they were the patients who were satisfied and would recommend this to somebody else. I have till date not explanted a single trifocal lens and there is, uh, except for one patient, there is no other patient who is on problems with the trifocal. Uh, and we have uh, the timer uh, muted, please. Sorry, there, there's no other speaker. Just give me please, another please, three minutes. Please mute the time. Please mute the timer. There is still time is there for this. Yes, session. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I have told the ABT. 95% of the patients have reported absence of photopic phenomena. Overall patient satisfaction score was 9.2. So this is something I would say that one of the uh, lenses in my armamentarium where I am putting it in a regular way uh, for all the patients who uh, want uh, correction for distance, intermediate and near. So uh, friends, and to sum up, I would say that this is one of the good lenses. There are other trifocal lenses that have come, but I think these eyes is offering good quality of vision and good outcomes. And uh, this is giving a uh, reasonable 100% spectacle independence at all distances, along with very high patient satisfaction. It is easy to put in the eye. The, there is no real problem. PCO rates are low. Uh, and this is not compromising the quality of uh, vision. Dysphotopic phenomena, patients' complaints are significantly less. So I have no hesitation in uh, kind of using this particular lens. The other advantage is that it comes in the toric, uh, toric variety and recently they had certain sales. So I have picked up a lot of these toric trifocals at good prices that they offered so that um, if there is a residual toricity that is there or a pre-existing, sorry, toricity, then we can... Uh, take care of that in these particular cases. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so so much, Dr. Maipal, for a detailed and exhaustive presentation on the trifocals. Uh, any question by the panelist? Of course, sir. Always been telling that uh, his first choice is going to be the. IOL platform rather than the laser refractive procedure. Uh, so even in the young patient also, patient around 42, 43 years old, still if they are fit for laser refractive procedure, still your first preference will be IOL platform, sir? Okay, so you are, if I get your uh, question correctly, you are talking about uh, prelex uh, press biopic lens exchange versus uh, press beyond, right? Yeah. Yeah, so basically, you know, the despite press beyond the uh, as the once you have taken out the lens of an individual, uh, 
uh, under those circumstances, there is going to be no change in the refractive status. But when you are doing a press beyond at that particular time, there is a, a regression that can happen. And second, with the change in the power, you either have to make that person fully corrected at that particular time for a plus three, or you uh, you need to do a touch up. I have several people who have had touch up. Samir Shah is one of them who needed a touch up over time. So uh, the corneal procedures are still requiring a mono vision, right? There is a residual power that you are using along with the nuction of spherical abrasion. So therefore, it is it is a compromised situation that you are having. And when we are using these lens based approach where we have good trifocal lenses and the patient is uh, 45 years and above, uh, I would say this is going to be the treatment of choice because you are aiming at emetropia for distance in both the eyes. Now, the second big thing is that there is a dysfunctional lens syndrome, which is there, where as, um, uh, as uh, Kundlu, you are aging, we have aged, the sharpness or the quality of vision that we had when we were youngsters is not there, even though one may or may not have a cataract. So this dysfunctional lens syndrome, normally we are not operating with these dysfunctional lens syndrome. You know, not, not all of us have eye trace and all. So, but if you have an eye trace and you look at the abrasions that are within the eyes, the lens weight abrasion, they are really phenomenally increasing as you age. So getting the lens out and replacing it by a better optical system is always going to be uh, the best thing. And then if you have done a refractive surgery, you will again need to do a cataract surgery uh, uh, again. So uh, with the cataract surgery becoming safer with good, the I would say the IUL platform was the limiting this thing. The, uh, the cataract surgery has really gone exponentially higher. So if you have the perfect platform for IOL, it is always going to be the lens-based procedure for the older people who need press biopic correction to go in for a lens-based procedure. I'll put my money on that rather than putting it on a press beyond or some cornea refractive where you are still doing monovision for that patient. Uh, sir, Dr. Grewal, sir, Maipal, sir, and Kudlu, could you each say that would you use the trifocal in a high myope again above 45 or even primarily a 30 year old who comes in for uh, either laser based or lens based surgery for a high myope now with a good trifocal would you prefer this as a good option even in a younger age group and then in a higher, high myope very high myope. shall i answer first yeah, please sir. okay uh, if with the current biometry techniques available to you, if the if the patient doesn't have a myopic degeneration, doesn't have CNVM, doesn't have any pathology, uh, the results that we have seen in the in these cases are really good, and it is more related to your biometry techniques and your accuracy of the biometry and the newer formulas like Barrett, which make it more kind of a decision tilting towards using uh, the lenses in in higher myops also. So my answer will be yes. So, uh, I think uh, just to add to what Dr. Garewal has added, uh, we are in India slightly hesitant to do a touch up for patients if they have a residual refractive error. I don't think we should hesitate in these patients. Supposing you have done a premium IOL and there is a residual refractive error, you can easily go ahead and do a surface ablation on these particular cases, even for errors of 0.75 or 1, because that's dramatically going to change the uh, the satisfaction rate of the patient. So uh, in those particular cases, I normally give a small trial of a patient with the residual refractive error because typically an ophthalmologist tell Nene Thika, you will get settled to it. Yes, there is a plasticity of the brain and the person could get settled to it. But if the person is not settling, I would give a trial of the residual refractive error worn in glasses to that patient. If the patient uh, gets a wow factor or the patient feels well, the majority of my uh, problems are sorted out, I'll go immediately and go ahead and do a touch up with the refractive procedure on top of uh, this particular refractive error. So uh, as Dr. Garewal said, that, uh, the biometry and the formulas have become much more predictable. So you can go ahead and uh, put these even in high myopes. As of now, uh, typically uh, at a 30 year age group, uh, it becomes very difficult to convince a patient that this is something that you're going to have a problem of press biopia because the patient has never seen press biopia. So as of now, I am I will go with a laser refractive surgery, which is a normal smile procedure that I do till the patient needs to get uh, the need for a, a, a kind of a press biopic uh, uh, solution. The other thing that is happening is now the star ICL uh, and uh, even IPCL, etc. They have introduced phacic uh, implants. 
so uh, once you have these phakic uh, implants that is the uh, uh, whether from the icl variety or from the uh, um, ipcl or whatever that would be a good alternative again if the quality of the trifocality or whatever they have the results that they are going on i think uh, star is introducing an eed of uh, form of a uh, phakic uh, implant so that would be something that i might want to do in a high myop in uh, a 30 year old good luck uh, so all my high myopic patient i love love to put either multifocal or trifocal and of course depending upon the retina condition i want to just give an example of my own aunt i operated her almost 17 years before she was a very high myopic her iol power was around right eye was around minus 3 and left eye was around minus 2 so that time she had a some amount of astigmatism also the toric multifocal was not there in the market but lisa was manufacturing the bifocal lens because of her toricity was around 1.25 in both the eyes then i have put a monofocal lens but after the surgery till today she is alive and she is cursing me and i stopped going her house just <laughs> because of only one reason she tell I used to read very well, my son, but you made me to stop reading in my life at all. Then I gave her plus three glasses with correcting astigmatism. Still, she could not able to get back her vision of not even N10. So that is the day from that day onwards, whatever, whoever the high myopic comes to me, either I put them a bifocals or trifocal, whatever the, depending upon the uh, lens available. No, uh, but uh, my pulse, uh, just to put it in more perspective, a minus 12 who is not fit for smile, would you not pref would you prefer a lens based procedure with a trifocal or an ICL? Age. And Kodal, sir, and Kudlu to also give the opinion. Age, age of the patient, sir. 30 years old. I will go in for an ICL. I'll also go here. for ICL. The point is that that patient still is uh, not uh, requiring press biopic. So he will be at the top of the world. Uh, his minification factor will go. He won't have abrasion. The patient is going to be fine. Let us, uh, what's the problem uh, uh, 15 years down the line when the patient has press biopia at that particular time, there will be new technologies that will be available. So you can just do an explant of the ICL uh, and uh, go ahead and do a press biopic uh, lens exchange at that particular time. So uh, the window is pretty large. Uh, see, uh, if I am looking at a 38, 39, 40 year old person, my thought process will be different versus if I'm looking at a 30. So if you are extending it to 30, then you can say even at 21, 22, you can uh, go ahead and do a clear lens extraction. Which so, I do so by one second, because the chances of having a posterior capsular opacification are reasonably high in these cases. And uh, then you have to look after the PCO and maybe a YAG capsule or me. So there could be some uh, deleterious effects on the retina. So I would rather go in for a phakic lens uh, than a clear lens extraction in patients at 30 years of age with high myopia. Greval, sir? I agree with it. I, I, I would, you see, now these lenses are called press biopia correcting lenses. And there is a reason why they are called press biopia lenses. That means they should be used in cases who are press biopsies. <laughs> that term, change in terminology is also something smart. <laughs> So, uh, if there's no other question, uh, we come to the end of the session. And uh, I thank AIOS and Zeiss for a great session. We had Dr. KK Mehta who talked about the astigmatism and he beautifully highlighted the need for astigmatism and the tools and techniques that we have corrected. We have a great talk by Dr. Kudlu on EDOP and trifocal lenses and trying to balance out between the two and doing the best to give, give the best possible solution to the patient. And we have a fantastic talk by Dr. Deepak on, on how to record better video surgeries, talking both about the technique of taking the pictures and also the equipment that should be available, especially which is affordable. And then we had a talk by Dr. Mahipal about the trifocal lenses, beautifully explaining uh, the lenses, its uh, physics and the results. Uh, I thanks all the speakers and panelists for a great session and thanks again to AIOS and Zeiss. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. All right.